don't know me, I'm Susan Storms. I'm the director of programs here at iHouse. And for new residents especially, I want to plug Welcome Week's activities, which are described in this brochure, and encourage you to attend the orientation night and the programs fair, which is scheduled for next Thursday night. So for tonight, it's a pleasure for me to welcome our guest speaker um, and to introduce him to you. Uh, tonight we welcome Ted Daly, who will speak on a topic about which he is very passionate, and which is the topic of his recent book, Apocalypse Never, uh, Forging the Path to a Nuclear Weapon-Free World. Tad is currently a writing fellow with International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and he has served as a speechwriter for U.S. Senator Alan Cranston, as well as Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Within the community of, community of eye houses worldwide, uh, Tad was a guest speaker at the International House at Berkeley several times and participated in their community um, during a week-long stay as a scholar activist in residence, is that correct? Um, and that's how we came to, um, to meet Tad and how he knew about us here in New York. After Tad's lecture tonight um, and some Q&A with you, uh, we've arranged for Tad to sell copies of his book and also we hope you'll stay and, and participate <coughs> in extending the conversation and enjoy some refreshments. So for now, let's welcome Tad Daly. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, there's my notes, actually. Thank you, Susan, very much. I am delighted to be here. As, uh, yeah, Susan says, I, for what it's worth, I, I live in Washington, DC, but that is only about a year uh, or so. I'm really a Californian. My wife moved from SoCal to Washington about a year and a half ago. Um, yes, and I think between 2004 and 2010, I did it again this past spring, I've done five different talks at the I House at uh, UC Berkeley. And yes, as Susan said, they actually invited me to move into the house for a week and came up with this title of Scholar Activist in Residence. <laughs> so I've been comparing Susan's offices to Lillian Koziol's offices out in California, her counterpart. Of course, that's a public university, you know, so they have budgetary issues. Um, I've met Martin Brennan, who is the counterpart of Don. Right. Yes. Uh, it's Ambassador Martin Brennan. Um, yes. I, uh, I've never spoken uh, in front in a room with a fireplace, though, and uh, we may have to fire it up uh, tonight. <laughs> And you know, in, in all seriousness, I guess one thing that I would like to say is um, it's a really cool idea. I mean, I've learned something uh, from my time. Is this, is, this, sounds like it's, is this okay? You guys can hear me? It sounds like it's reverberating a little bit. You guys tell me. I like the idea. I mean, I, the people at the I House at Berkeley told me about the history of the idea and the idea of getting American students, since we are a place here in the United States, to live with and interact with and get to know and get to understand and, and communicate on a very rich level with uh, students from all over the world. It is a, uh, thank you, yeah, it, it, it's booming a little bit or something. It's a wonderful idea, and it's, it's why I uh, kept coming back to the I House at Berkeley and why I uh, actually asked Lillianne if she would uh, approach Susan and invite me. And yet there's something I just want to say about the idea, and it's kind of an ill-formed thought in my head, but I guess I hope that a century from now, a place like this is a bit of an anachronism. I guess what I mean by that is obviously we will all be from different places. There will still be people living in Brazil or South Africa or Germany or Argentina and of course the United States. But it is my hope and I think my deepest seated conviction that the great story of the 21st century is going to be a larger identity and a larger loyalty. And I think it will be, I think, I hope and think that a century from now it will be intuitive for most people to think of themselves first and foremost not as Argentinians or Brazilians or Sri Lankans or, or, or what have you, but as Earthlings, as members of the human community. Just like today I, growing up in Chicago and living in California for a quarter century, think of myself, I guess, in a context like this primarily as an American rather than a Chicagoan or an Angelino. I, it is my, my faith and my hope that 
a century from now, our here's how I'd like to put it because I'm really it was just just kind of thinking about this in the last hour or so that our national patriotism will still be something important to us and still be something that all of us feel, but it will be transcended by our planetary patriotism and our loyalty to the whole of the human community and the whole of the planet on which all of us reside. And I will close this opening by saying, I guess I feel like, Don, that this idea of these international houses that have been around for close, I guess it's going on 85 years now, if I have that right, is really one of the leading edges. Uh, I think the I House, the International House ethos, is really one of the leading edge, edges of creating this vision of one world. So that is how I feel about being here at the I House with all of you. So that said, I would now like to speak about uh, my topic and my new book, uh, Apocalypse Never, Forging the Path to a Nuclear Weapon-Free World. And I'd like to share some thoughts and observations with you all tonight about the immediate nuclear peril and the vision of nuclear weapons abolition. And you know, I, this is my first book, uh, came out about six months ago. Um, I've been, um, I've given lots of talks uh, over the years, in the past quarter century or so, but I have learned that once you have a book out, people don't expect you just to talk, they expect you to do some readings. So I will open by reading a passage from the book, and you guys can tell me whether you think this is policy wonky and heavy and and <clears throat> and technical, or whether it's really about the vision that we all aspire, the vision of the world that we all aspire to create. So this is the opening passage of chapter nine, which I call the architecture of a nuclear weapon-free world. My childhood pastor at St. Edna's Catholic Church in Arlington Heights, Illinois, the Reverend James Doherty, an irascible and intimidating old Irishman, liked to tell a story about something that happened across the water from his beloved homeland many centuries ago. It was right around the turn of the 13th century and a traveler was venturing across medieval France when he stumbled upon the very beginnings of Chartres, the cathedral. It took a full 66 years to construct, from 1194 to 1260, and here it was in its very earliest stages. So the traveler approached the workers and asked, what are you doing? Me said the first, I'm carving stone, that's what I do, I'm a stone carver. Me said the second, I'm cutting glass, that's what I do, I'm a glass cutter. Me said the third, I'm hammering nails, that's what I do, I'm a carpenter. Then the traveler saw an old, old woman, tiny, hunched over, sweeping dust and debris, her hands wrapped around an ancient broom that looked like it had seen every bit as much of the hard life of medieval Europe as she had. The traveler asked, old woman, what are you doing? The old lady paused and then stood up straight, all four feet, 11 inches of her. And she answered, me? What am I doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm building a cathedral a cathedral that will soar to the heavens, a cathedral that will stand for a thousand years, a cathedral that will give everlasting glory to the spirit of the divine. Come back in a couple of centuries, traveler, and see what I have wrought. So it seems to me that that parable uh, that I really did hear when I was a kid uh, in my Catholic church in Arlington Heights, Illinois, it seems to me that there are several messages uh, that we can take from that. One is that in many, many of the endeavors on which uh, we are engaged uh, can take many decades to construct, but if we do it right, it can really last a great deal longer than that. Another, it seems to me, and that's why I opened this chapter with it, is that it's very important to have a goal, a destination, a vision, an architecture uh, of the world, the entity, the creation that one is trying to uh, to build or achieve or create. And then I think finally, um, I think maybe the most important message of that parable that applies to my nuclear weapons abolitionist work, but to many other many other endeavors, is that each of us has a role to play, no matter how big or how small. And that old woman clearly understood that she was part of something larger 
than herself. So let's talk about the nuclear peril. I have written this book. It is called Apocalypse Never. Here's what it is about. It is about the urgent and immediate nuclear peril. Very different from that which people like Don and I, a little older than the rest of you cats, uh, grew up with, but very immediate and very real. It is about the vision of dismantling every last atom bomb on planet Earth and banning them and making sure they don't come back into the history of the human race ever again. And it is about, I hope, plausible futures by which such abolition might actually come about. That was a very long sentence, but I think it was a one sentence summary of my entire book. Thank you very much. Um, but I do want to say this too, besides that summary of the substance of the book that I, I will share with you that I, I started the thing about five years ago and I tried very hard to write a book that would not be for scholars and not be for experts and not be for policy wants, but would be something that would be accessible and engaging to ordinary folks, ordinary citizens of the human community who are, some, who are concerned about the fate of the human community. And why did I set out to write a book about that because I want it and me and us to play a role in building a movement for a world without nuclear weapons, a step on the road to a world without war itself because social change happens when people demand social change and when people organize and when people focus and when people try to move history themselves. And that has happened many times in human histories and in human history and many other endeavors, and I want it to happen now in the nuclear endeavor. And that is the aspiration I set for myself uh, about this book. And I cannot promise that it will have that result of really playing a crucial role in stimulating and growing the nuclear abolitionist movement. But as the hockey star Wayne Gretzky likes to say, you always miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So I think it's always important in any endeavor to get out there and to take a shot. So let me tell you a little bit about that urgent and immediate nuclear peril that I, that I said is, uh, is, very, is here and very real. Um, uh, very different, as I said, from the, that which uh, existed during the Cold War. Um, chapter three of my book is called The Nightmare of Nuclear Terror. And you may have thought that I brought this orange up here just so I could toss it around and be kind of cool and cavalier and flip. But no, it is a prop. Because you know what? That could destroy New York. That's what it takes. It takes this, uh, a, a mass of either highly enriched uranium or plutonium about the size of an orange to fashion a crude atomic bomb. And there are 23,000 nuclear weapons on planet Earth today, still. There are, oh boy, I don't know the figure, there are thousands of tons of highly enriched uranium or weapons-grade plutonium, thousands of tons. This would weigh more than, uh, than an orange would, uh, a mass this size, but it wouldn't weigh a ton. In fact, I think it's a, a few kilograms is what plutonium this size would weigh. I still may toss it around just to kind of have it as a prop. But the thing, the thing about nuclear terror, the thing about the possibility of a non-state actor, Mohammed Atta's cousin, here we are in New York City, we all know, everybody in the world knows that name, Mohammed Atta. And I am sorry to report that I think it's almost certain that Mohammed Atta's cousin, speaking metaphorically, and many others like him are today aspiring to this most horrific of all acts, to either obtain just one, of those atom bombs or to obtain something like this and then to get a few engineers and a few electricians and a few physicists um, to build and fashion a crude nuclear device. It will not be an easy thing to pull off, but if a thousand people or teams try to pull it off uh, in the next couple of decades and 999 of them fail, we lose New York or Moscow, or Beijing, or Johannesburg, or what have you. And I think the danger of nuclear terror is very real, and there's short-term strategies to work on it. There are medium-term strategies to work on it, and we can talk a little bit about that in the question and answer session. But in the long term, I think the only solution to the danger of nuclear terror, and indeed 
all the other nuclear dangers that I will chat with you about tonight is in fact the abolition of nuclear weapons. Worry about nuclear terror and let's do something about it.